hopefully you can see my screen with my first slide. I'm really excited to be here to hopefully get at least some of you um, as excited about science as I am, because I really love doing science and I really feel lucky that I actually get to, to be a scientist um, as, a, as my career. So I'll just start with a, a little bit about myself. Uh, I grew, was born and grew up right here in Saskatoon. I went to Holy Cross High School where my kids go and have gone. And after uh, finishing high school, I didn't really know what I wanted to do, but I always knew I kind of liked science. So I explored different scientific options once I got to the University of Saskatchewan. And what, what really stood out to me um, in, in looking at different uh, scientific options was microbiology. And the reason microbiology really stood out to me is because there's such a broad range of things that you can do in microbiology. Of course, there's the medical aspect that's been front and center for these last months with the coronavirus outbreak. That's a really important part of microbiology. But there's a lot of other important um, parts of microbiology as well, including things like industrial microbiology, which is where I did uh, my own PhD work. Um, you can work in the food industry. You can work, as, as I have, ultimately, in agriculture. And I love working in agriculture because it touches absolutely everything that we do. Um, you know, it's, it underpins our, our whole society, really. Everybody has to eat. So I feel really lucky that I'm able to, 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 to do that. And, and just in general, being involved in science is exciting because it's very international. And in fact, I had the, the opportunity to, uh, to experience that during my PhD work where I did part of my PhD work at a lab in the south of France. And, but more important than that, um, working in science, you get the chance to work with people from all over the world. And that's because science is inherently international. It's, uh, it doesn't... It doesn't um, respect borders in the sense that it's a human activity. The broad rules that govern science are the same all over the world. So you get this chance to work with people from all over the world, and it's a, it's a real privilege to be able to do that. So I want to um, spend a few minutes now talking about one aspect of the work that I do in, in agricultural microbiology, and, uh, and that's the identification of insects and of the bacteria that the insects might carry on them or in them using something called molecular barcodes. So, of course, if we're talking about molecular barcodes, we're talking about DNA. And I'm sure all of you have heard of DNA, kind of know what it is, more or less. But just to bring us all up to the same page here, talk a little bit about, um, about what DNA is. So DNA basically contains the information for your cells or the cells of any living creature to make its proteins. So DNA contains the information for the cells to make the proteins. And the proteins really determine what kind of cell that is, whether it's an enzyme or whether it's a structural protein. It determines what kind of cell that is, whether it's a bacteria or you and I or insects or fungi or plants, or even, although it's a little bit more complicated, viruses like, our, the, like the coronavirus. Essentially, the information contained in that DNA or the nucleic acid determines what kind of creature that is, whether it's a human or a cow or a fungus or a bug or a plant whatever it happens to be. So DNA is a really, really important molecule, and it's, uh, it's there in all living creatures um, on, on our planet. So what is DNA? It's worth thinking about what DNA is. Um, and of course, the answer can be very complicated um, chemically, but for our purposes today, we can think of DNA as basically a molecule that's like a long string, and it's made up of four compounds that chemists call nucleotide bases. And these bases have the fancy names you see there. You don't really need to worry about that you can think of them as letters, A, G, C, and T. So, and the order or the sequence of these bases in that long string um, in each cell tells the cell what proteins to make and thereby what kind of cell it is. And this string can be very, very long. As you can see there, you and I, the cells that, that make up humans, these, uh, the, the string contains 3 billion of these bases in each of our cells. Fungi might be a little bit less, but still a lot, all the way to bacteria. Uh, which is uh, quite a lot smaller, but still a very significant number of these nucleotide letters. So we can use these DNA sequences to identify things. And to use an analogy here, when you go to the grocery store and you grab a, a tub of Activia off the shelf and you take it to the barcode scanner, that Activia yogurt is, is identified by a string of numbers that the barcode scanner, scanner can see right away. And by the order of these numbers, which the barcode can, scanner can read, it knows that you've selected Activia yogurt, and it even knows that you've selected vanilla Activia yogurt, and you haven't selected ice cream or bread or even blueberry Activia yogurt. So you can use these numbers to tell apart um, different products in the grocery store. Well, in exactly the same way, 
you can use that string, that long uh, string of letters and the order in which they are present in a cell to determine what kind of creature you're looking at. And not only, not only can you determine if it's a bug or a plant or a bacterium, you can determine what kind of bug or bacterium or, um, or plant or whatever it is that you're looking at. So this string is kind of like a very long book. Uh, the alphabet is very short, only four letters, but it's a little bit like a long book that we can use to read what kind of creature it is. So there's a couple of challenges that you face when you're looking at this. The first one is, how do we get some DNA out of our organism? And in this case, it's a bug. And then how do we get enough of the DNA to know what the sequence is? And the third question is, what part of the DNA do we look at? So 100 million letters, for in the case of a bug, is a really long book. We don't want to read that long. So I'm going to just show you very quickly what, uh, what kind of thing we do in order to get the DNA out of the bug and then get enough of the DNA. So what I've got in this vial, and you're not really meant to see it very well, that's the whole purpose, are some very tiny bugs that we captured in a field. And the question is, what kind of bugs are these? And in order to get the DNA out of the bug, we use this, this thing called uh, plant paper. So this is kind of a special paper because uh, although it's just dry piece of paper, Inside of it are the chemicals that will break open the cells of the bug so that we can get the DNA out. So if I take one of these bugs and I put it onto the plant card and I, I need to break the cells. So to break the cells of the bug, I can use my handy dandy uh, paint can opener and I just give it a whack. So now you can't see it, but there's a splotch on this paper, which corresponds to a flattened bug and all of the liquid inside the bug has wet the chemicals, which has broken open the cells. And I can use this paper punch to punch out a part of the um, paper which contains the bug. And I put the tube and I do a couple of washes. And what I end up with is a solution that looks like this. Um, I've got two of them here. One of them is colored just so you can see it. it normally it would be not colored, but the, 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 this is what you end up with. A solution like this that contains the DNA from that bug, and it also contains the DNA from whatever bacteria or fungi might be associated with that bug. But the amount is tiny. You saw how small that bug is. So let's take a look at how we get enough of the DNA to know what the sequence is and what part of the DNA we look at. So I'm just going to show this animation for the, something called the polymerase chain reaction. Before I do, I'll note that this is the very same method that people use to detect the coronavirus in the nasal swabs because you get a tiny amount of the coronavirus um, nucleic acid onto those nasal swabs as well. So hopefully you can see this. PCR is a powerful technique that allows us to make billions of copies of specific pieces of DNA. The first step in PCR is to open up the two strands of DNA to expose the genetic information encoded by the nitrogen bases. A, C, T, and G. In the next step, custom-made DNA molecules help us find the beginning and end of the DNA piece of interest among the billions of letters in the genome. These genetic bookmarks are called primers. The third and final step is to fill in the genetic information between the primers. An enzyme called DNA polymerase adds the building blocks of DNA called nucleotides. To create I'm gonna do one so it's actually not I can't see it. <laughs> polymerase works in our own cells to replicate. Well, that's really too bad. So I guess I have to do the stop share and reshare then. Really exactly what I was afraid of. So you could hear it, but you couldn't see it. Yes. Okay. because I've tried to do it right through the, um, the PowerPoint. Okay, can you now see it? I'll just back it up a little bit. Yes. DNA polymerase adds the building blocks of DNA called nucleotides to create an identical DNA strand. DNA polymerase works in our own cells to replicate our own DNA each time a cell divides. The first step in PCR is known as denaturation and is enabled by high heat. The second step is called annealing, and different primers have different and very specific annealing temperatures. 
typically between 50 and 60 degrees Celsius. The third step is called extension. DNA polymerase used in PCR works best at 72 degrees Celsius. In these three steps, we've taken our original DNA molecule and obtained an identical copy of a very specific fragment. If we repeat these three steps one more time, we'll go from two copies to four, repeat it again and we'll obtain eight copies, and again, and we'll get 16, and 32, and 64, 128, well, you get the idea. DNA amplification by PCR is an exponential process. After 30 copy cycles, we will have 2 to the 30, or 1 billion identical DNA copies. This is enough DNA, for example, to detect a pathogen in blood such as HIV or Ebola, or to amplify trace amounts of DNA found at a crime scene, or to enable any of the other powerful applications of PCR. Okay, so I'll stop sharing and reshare. Don't worry. We're on track. Polymerase chain reaction, oh, or track. PCR, uses repeated cycles of heating and cooling to make many copies of a specific region of DNA. Okay, so can you see the PowerPoint again? So that's how we get enough of the DNA and how we know what part of the DNA that we need to look at. So when the question arises, what DNA barcode can we use? And that just depends on what bookmarks or PCR primers we add into that solution that they're of a very tiny amount of DNA. So for the bugs, we use a gene called cytochrome oxidase 1 or CO1. And for the bacteria, we use CPN60. And you use, just simply use different um, uh, PCR primers or bookmarks for each barcode. So I want to show you what that actually looks like. And to do that, um, should be able to can you see the can you see a something called finch tv on the screen okay so this is the kind of program that we use and um we we send away our sequences to toronto and they send us back these files and they look like this so this just comes to us and you can see that the 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 dna sequence that we get is a long string of bases you can see the letters that are that are en encoded there so we process these and um we end up with, uh, I knew this was going to be a problem. Can you see the, the string of letters? Okay, so we share again. Okay, so there should be a series of letters on the screen. And uh, this is what we end up with. This is our DNA barcode or our bookmark from that unknown bug. And if we want to find out what that unknown bug is, we take it to a website, which I hope you can see there called an identification engine. And we simply paste it in. So you saw those little tiny bugs. This is the barcode that I ended up with from those little tiny bugs. And I'm just going to submit it and it's going to work. And it will tell us in just a minute what kind of bug this little tiny um, thing in the vial here actually is. Just a two minute warning, Dr. Dumonso. Yeah. So we can see that from this, uh, this identification engine, we have identified our bug as Macrostelis quadrilineatus. It's a leaf hopper and its probability is 100%. So we can even see where in the world this bug has typically been found. So in a similar vein, we can use um, uh, um, the other sequence, which is the CPN60 sequence to find out what kind of bacterium we have in the um, in that particular insect, so I'm going to reshare. You should see something on your screen called CPN Classifier. So this is a website that we made up ourselves, and in a similar vein, we add our CPN60 sequence that we amplified that we using that polymerase chain reaction out of that bug. And this is a real sequence 
that we got out of a, a leaf hopper that we captured in a blueberry field in Nova Scotia. So this is a real bacterium associated with um, a real um, insect found in a Canadian um, blueberry producer's field. And it's doing its thing here. It's calculating, calculating. And because I made this website, I know what it's doing. It's looking for little four base pair or six base pair signatures in this sequence. And it's using it to identify that organism. So you can see here that it's determined that this particular um, organism is a phytoplasma, which is a type of, uh, of bacterium that causes um, uh, disease in blueberries and many other plants. And we've determined that it is actually um, a, exactly what type it is. So what it's actually done is calculated all these different numbers for all the different phytoplasmas and determined, if you can see here, that it's got a, a match of 100% to this particular type of phytoplasma. So I can use that to say, not only does it have phytoplasma, but the type of phytoplasma that it has. So um, that's a very quick demonstration of um, DNA barcoding. And the, the final thing to point out before I'm finished here is, I hope you can see the screen, is that we don't necessarily have to sequence the DNA to detect the pathogen. In fact, when we know what we're looking for, in this case, we have a leaf hopper with phytoplasma in its salivary glands, we can use a much more rapid test, which changes either yellow in case it has phytoplasma or pink if it does not have phytoplasma in as little as 10 minutes. And this is very similar to the kind of rapid test they're talking about for, um, for the coronavirus, where you don't have to, to do these longer um, uh, methods to find out what it is. So that's all I had to, uh, to discuss. I apologize for the screen sharing and uh, that's it. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. DiManso. Um... Any questions out there? If not, um, I was just going to ask, I, I'm, I'm very interested to see like how, how much kind of tech goes into um, analyzing the DNA. So how much of a, um, I guess, how much, how much technology, how much of a technology background do you have? And how important is, is that to your ability to, to do your work? Well, I'm, I, I, I'm pretty limited, as you could see during that presentation, I'm pretty <laughs> limited in terms of technical skills with the computer. Um, I could do some things, of course, but things like building the website, which did all the calculations and all that, I, I worked with somebody who had a, a computer science degree and a computer science background in order to... Uh, to put that up. And some of the other more sophisticated analyses really need some uh, um, computer science uh, kind of background. So mm -hmm. um, I myself am not a terribly advanced computer user, but, um, but that's one of the beauties of science is it's very collaborative in nature. Mm -hmm. I can't know everything. It's impossible. So what I don't know, I fill in the gaps by talking to people who do know. And, and scientists by their nature are collaborative. That's one of the greatest things about being in science. Oh, that's fantastic. Fantastic. Um, one other question I do have too is we can, we can see that you're working from home right now. So how has COVID changed your research? How has COVID changed your day to day? Yeah. Well, what it's done for me is um, I'm not at the lab. I'm, I'm one of the scientists that actually spends a reasonable amount of time at the lab bench doing stuff. And that has certainly stopped. Um, in the last in the last months, a lot more at home. Um, I've been busy in the last month since we've been all sent home doing administrative duties because I was associate director for a little while. So there was a lot of uh, a lot of activity surrounding that, and I've only really been back to the science work as of October first. So for a couple of weeks. So in that time, um, scientists have to have to be pretty um, well versed in the literature. So there is a lot of time spent reading and reviewing work of other scientists and submitting your own work for peer review and, and possible publication. And then of course, we're always looking for funding. So that's, uh, that's an ongoing challenge. Okay, fantastic. Thank you so much, Dr. Dumanso. Um, next up, Dr. Smith, if you are, if you are there, you wanna? I certainly am. To Good the morning, mic. everybody. <laughs> Can you hear me okay? Good. As you see, I'm working at home and I keep having to move the computer because the sun is moving. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna just basically give you a brief overview of what I do and then I'll finish off by just telling you a bit more about how I ended up in Saskatoon. 
because you've probably worked out I'm not from around here. Okay, first of all, I'll do some screen sharing. If I can get it to work. This may take a second or two. Okay, I hope everybody can see the slides, okay. So I'm Mark Smith, I'm a research scientist at Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada in Saskatoon. This is a picture of our building and the big red star shows you where my lab is up on the third floor. We also, we do most of our work in the, in the laboratory. We also have access to greenhouses and to the fields which um, we use around Saskatoon. And most of our stuff is done at the bench in the laboratory. And really what we're doing is we're trying to use science to improve Canadian crops. So what do I work on? Um, really what the basic stuff, things that we're doing is we're trying to work out how plants work. What makes a plant a plant and how does it grow? Things like that. So if you think of an engine in your car, it's made up of a whole bunch of different parts which are all put together to make the car work. And the plant is very similar. It's got lots of parts. It's got lots of systems that all work together to make a plant grow and produce food. And we're interesting to know how it all works together. And why do we need that? Um, really what we want to do is use this information to make crops grow better. And we want them to grow better so we can produce more food without cutting down more rainforests and plowing up more land. We want plants to be more productive. We want to be able to grow plants without using pesticides and herbicides too much. And we also need to grow crops that are a little more adapted to changing climate. So uh, that's our overall goal in the long term is to produce better and more efficient crops for Canada. So I have a team that works with me. They actually do all the hard work in the lab. There is two technicians at the back. Well, I'm somewhere in the back there. A couple of technicians in the back who do most of the lab work. They are university graduates and they went straight from university into a science career with Agriculture Canada. So they're very specialized in bench research and they're extremely good and I, I couldn't do it without them basically. And I also have a whole bunch of students that come through the lab and we train them and they do projects for us. So we train them and they produce data for us and do things that, that are helpful to us. Uh, the ones at the front are co-op students. So they're graduate students who are doing a co-op program where they're at university and they're also learning practical work in laboratories. Uh, we use a whole variety of different techniques, chemical analysis, biochemistry, molecular biology, genomics, genetics, and we get to play with some pretty neat machines. Over here, we have a, a mass spectrometer, a Molditoff. Down here, this is the gas chromatogram, which we use to look at plant oils. This is a sequencing machine. It's now out of date, but it used to be one of my favorite sequencing machines. Oops, going back. And we, we grow plants in the greenhouse. We look at them, we grind them up, we extract stuff, and we also use we make transgenic plants as tools to investigate systems in the plant. This down here in the bottom is one where we've actually transformed the seeds with a protein that makes them glow. Just to quickly go through some of the projects that I have in the lab right now. One of the major projects is looking at oil. So I'm sure you're all familiar with canola. You see it everywhere in the spring, nice yellow fields. Canola oil comes from the seed of the canola plant. What we want to find out is how the plant makes the oil so that we can work out how to make more oil per acre or healthier oils or even oil that we can use to make plastic. So we're investigating the biological processes in the plant that actually function to make the oil. Here's another project, one of my favorites. This is a project on wax. So if you spelt your some your coffee down your shirt, it would sink in usually. 
But if you poured water on a canola plant, most of it just sits there in little droplets and it pretty much all rolls off the plant. That's because plants have a waterproof layer on the outside. And this is a based, it's a wax type of material on the plant. And what we've been interested in doing is finding out what the composition of that wax is and also how the plant makes the wax. The plant's protecting itself from water loss and from the environment. We want to know how it does it and how we can use that information to make plants that are a little bit more tolerant perhaps to pests or more tolerant to drought. And to do that, we basically take a leaf and you dip it in something like gasoline to wash off all the wax because it doesn't wash off in water. And then you analyze it with things like the mass spec that I showed you just to work out what the components are. So that's one of the projects we had going, looking at wax. Something else we're looking at, some plants like canola, if you get a little bit of frost in the spring, they're basically toast, you have to reseed and that's a pain in the neck. But there are other plants, like in this picture, you see these little pigweed seeds, that are seedlings that are quite happy in a little bit of frost. So we're interested to know how some plants can tolerate frost or cold weather and some can't. And if we understand that better, we may be able to make plants that are a little bit more tolerant of something like a spring frost. So it'll all help produce better crops, basically. So part of this, our, our work is mostly discovery, but to turn that into something useful, you have to go through a process of plant breeding where you discover something, you find differences and you bring them together through breeding to make a better crop. So if you think about dogs, you've got a huge variety, a range of diversity. This is all one species, but you've got everything from the Great Dane in the back to this silly little chihuahua right in the front. If you want to make something like a Labradoodle, you just take two very diverse animals, a nice Labrador and a Poodle, cross them together, and bingo, you've got some kind of Labradoodle. It's pretty much the same with plants. So if we're breeding better plants, we need diversity. This is a picture of a very close relative, a canola. All of these plants in these clumps are basically the same species, but they're different varieties. And you can see they're very different. This one's purple. This one is very leafy. This one is already flowering. They're all planted at the same time. So we have a lot of diversity there. And from our research, what we're doing is we're looking at these differences to see whether there's useful things in maybe a plant like this that we could use to breed better plants by crossing them with other ones. So if we know the processes, we know the genes that are involved, we can use that in plant breeding. And going over to one of my favorite subjects is oil. We can also, there's also opportunities to do this with species that are not the same, where you identify processes in different plants and you can use that knowledge to breed better crops. So if you think about oil, in the springtime you see all these, these uh, elm trees full of little seeds. If you took the oil out of there, I mean these plants oil make, all make a little bit of oil in the seed. This would be something very much like butter. Down here, castor oil, the oil from that is very thick. It's very good as a lubricant. So if we can work out the processes in these plants that make different types of oil, we can help use that information to make better oil in our crop plants. So that was talking about natural diversity. I'm gonna quickly talk about one project we're doing right now where we're generating diversity. So you can do that in many different ways. You can do mutation, you can do genetic engineering, you can even do genome editing when you're changing specific genes. But one of the projects I have running at the moment, we're doing a mutation program. Well, basically we're trying to speed up evolution by changing the DNA of the plant faster than it would normally change. And to do that, we took some seeds from Camelina we sent them down to California and they popped them in one of the nuclear reactors at the university. And basically they bombarded the seeds with, with neutron radiation. And then we bring the seeds back and plant them and look to see what differences we have in the plants. So it's neutron radiation. These plants are not radioactive or anything because these particles just go straight through the plant and they're gone. They don't stay in the plant. 
But what they do is they make changes to the DNA of the plant. So if you think of the DNA in the seed as a recipe book for a dinner like your Thanksgiving dinner, you have a bunch of different, different uh, foods that you, that you have recipes for, and they're all made out of words that you read. So fast neutron basically changes or destroys the words in your recipe. So if you have something like pumpkin pie with ice cream and you took out one word like ice, you'd have pumpkin pie with cream. So you'd have a slightly different recipe would still taste really good. So what we're trying to do with the plants is to take out specific genes to change the plant to make it either better or to find out more about how the plant works. What happens if you lose a gene? What happens if you change a gene? This is all basically generating knowledge that we can use to breed better plants. And uh, we end up with a whole bunch of interesting plants. I don't know if you can see it very well, but we've changed one. This one doesn't seem to have any side branches. This one has lots of branches. They're all quite different from each other. Okay, I'll quickly, I probably don't have a lot of time. So why did I end up as a scientist in Saskatoon? Uh, well, I started off in my school days in England at a, in a place called Norwich, very kind of flat part of the country, quite like, a lot like Saskatoon, except fields are smaller and it doesn't go to minus 40 every winter. But I wasn't sure what I really wanted to do. We had uh, lots of uh, talks about careers and field trips at school, and I got interested in science. We had trips to France, had a chance to talk about languages, things like that. And science was always more interesting. So I was kind of worrying, wondering whether I should be something like an archaeologist or a paleontologist dig up dinosaurs or a research scientist. So basically this is the career path that I ended up taking. So at school we did lots of trips where you get a feeling for what potential jobs could be. Talks, trips, that kind of thing. And as I was interested in science, what I actually did was took a summer job at a research station just to see whether I'd actually really like it or not. And that gave me the idea that, yes, this is kind of interesting and it's something I might want to do. So then you go to university, which is three year course. Again, one quick summer job, just to make sure. Then the rest of my summer jobs were spent working in a pub, but uh, that's different. That tells you you don't want to spend a career working in a pub. And then to, to turn this into a career, you need to do extra degree after your, your Bachelor of Science. So I did a PhD degree in England at the university there. And that gives you a feeling for real research because you have to do research and write it up to get a PhD. And after that, it was a, a chance to either go and do something else or take this into a career in, as, a, as a technician or something like that, or try and get a career where you're going to be leading your own laboratory. And for that, you really wanna do something which is extra and it's called postdoctoral research, which gives you more experience and it gives you a better chance of actually getting a job because it's very competitive to get a job as a research scientist or at a university teacher. And in the end, I managed to get a job in uh, Saskatoon of all places. And I've been there for the last 50 years and I don't regret it at all even though it's Saskatoon and not somewhere nice and warm. So that's basically my career path. Uh, why do I do it? Why am I still here? It's really job satisfaction. I really like what I'm doing because you get to explore things. You get to try new techniques. You have independence in what you do. You don't have to report to your boss every day. Boss is helpful around here, very useful, but you're the one who's driving your research. You have to find the money to actually do the research. And as Tim said, it's also because science is global. So when I was doing my PhD, I didn't get a chance to work in south of France, but I ended up in Sweden, <laughs> which actually was a really cool place. And after that, I moved to Vancouver. I spent seven years working in Vancouver at UBC before I came to Saskatoon. And people I've trained are now in different parts of the world. One of my students is, has his own laboratory in China. 
And he's invited me over there on a few occasions. So I've got to explore China and meet people there and see how the research works there. And we've also have the opportunity to travel for conferences. Right now, that's not going to happen because of COVID, but I believe we should be able to do that again at some point. So it's a career that is really interesting, very satisfying, and really gives you a different perspective on the world too, because you can, you can communicate and work with people anywhere you like. So I highly recommend it. It's hard work to get there, but it's really worth it. And I'm gonna stop there. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Smith. Um, you're right on time, perfect timing. Um, any questions out there? The chat's been um, pretty quiet. But if there's no questions from our classes, I do have a couple. Um, you mentioned um, hiring of, of, of students, of um, research, researchers. What are, what are some of the most important skills that you look for when hiring people to work in your lab and your research program? So um, I need students who have enthusiasm and interested in what they're doing. So when I talk to them, I make sure that they're actually really interested in it and they're not just doing it because they've been told they have to. Mm -hmm. So enthusiasm is really important. Also some knowledge and a little bit of experience in science, even it's, if it's through laboratory classes, these are university students, so they do have a, a, a bit of laboratory training. So they need to have the basic understanding but I'm not expecting anybody to know everything when they come in because I'm quite prepared to train them. But I need them to be enthusiastic and keen to learn. So that's really what I'm looking for. Okay, great. And then same question as Dr. Dumonso, how has COVID changed um, the way you work and research? Okay, well, I'm basically working from home full time. <laughs> Been back to the lab maybe twice since March. So for me, I did, I used to do some bench work, which I really enjoy. So I kind of missed that a lot. I did bring a few things home in the basement, but it's, you can't bring PCR machines and GCs back home. Mm -hmm. So that's restricted what I do bench work, but there's always writing grant applications, writing papers, reviewing data. And now my team is going back into the lab in shifts and they're starting to produce information and data. So my day-to-day -day stuff is basically helping them interpret the data and guide them in what to do. And it's changed a lot. It's not as fun because you don't get to chat to your colleagues and discuss things like we used to. Mm -hmm. You can through Zoom and things, but it's not the same. No, no. But we're still trying to be productive. We're a lot less productive at the moment, but we're working out how to change that. Yeah. We're adapting. Yes, yeah, pivot. Pivot is the word of the year for sure. Okay, well, great. Thank you so much, Dr. Smith. Um, You're welcome. Dr. Van Kowski, are you there? Get your screen up. There we go. Okay, Dr. Van Kowski, the mic is yours. I'll let you take over. Great, thank you so much. Um, so I'm just going to get this presentation pulled up here. Okay, so Thanks for inviting me to take part in this. Um, uh, as you've already heard, I am an entomologist, and so that means that I study insects. But of course, um, getting off to my career, I had no idea that studying insects was something that you could do um, and make a living. And so just to give everyone a little bit of a background about where I've come from, um, I am from a very small town in rural Alberta, northwest of Edmonton. So if you've ever driven on Highway 16 and gone out to Jasper, then you've driven by Wildwood, but not through it because the highway doesn't go right into the town. And so for kindergarten to grade nine, I went to the Wildwood School. And then in 2000, I had to bus down the highway about 15 minutes to another bigger town where they actually had a high school. And so from going to grade nine with eight people in my class, I went to 
the high school where there were about 40 people in my class. And at the end of 2003, when I finished high school, I graduated in a class of about 30 kids. And uh, I was lucky enough to be class valedictorian, but that didn't mean much when I got to the University of Alberta because that's a huge school. And so I went from classes of about 30 students to classes of hundreds of students, um, which is of course now online and been quite affected by, by COVID. But so I spent a, a number of years at the University of Alberta. I went there for my undergraduate, which I have a Bachelor of Science and that's in biology. And I minored in history because I like that kind of thing. I also stayed there and got my master of science. And in that case, I studied plant, um, plant science in the Department of Agriculture. And that's kind of during my undergrad, of course, like I went in planning to be a medical doctor. And by the end of my first year, I was just like, nope, I don't really like what goes on in the human body. I wanna learn more about what goes on in the world. So I started studying just ecology in general. I took some entomology classes, and then that led me to take some agriculture classes. And even though I grew up on a farm, I'd never really thought about the things that support agriculture. And so that was really when I started to learn more about the opportunities and what was out there. So I finished my master of science in 2010, and then I went to the University of Windsor for my PhD, and that was another five years of school. So after 12 years of going to university, I finally had my PhD and was pretty well versed in the biology of insects. And then I moved to California for a year where I did a postdoc, like Dr. Smith just talked about postdocs, you just do some extra research. And then finally, I ended up in Saskatoon with Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada in 2016. So it's been a long adventure. Um, my dad used to get asked a lot, what's Megan going to be when she's finally done school? And my dad always joked, well, she'll be 30. <laughs> and, and that's about how it worked out. I turned 30 and got my PhD and then got a full-time job a few years later. But I could have stopped anywhere along this, really. Um, finished my Bachelor of Science or finished my Master's and been able to work in agriculture as a research technician supporting agricultural science in various ways. So there's a lot of opportunities along your educational career to get involved in agriculture. So I study insects. My focus is on agricultural insects, but I'm really interested in all of the insects that are out there and there's a huge diversity. So there's all kinds of different careers that people can pursue if you're interested in entomology. Taxonomy is very important, that's identifying insects. And part of that is using the tools that Dr. DeMonso talked about earlier, but it can also be focused on using the morphology and what insects look like in order to identify them. There's, um, and there's so many different ways that you can study entomology or get involved in entomology. So taxonomy is, is really important, but there's also biological control of insect pests. There's forest entomology where you focus on the insects that affect tree, tree growth and, and tree pests and things like that. Um, there's med vet ent entomology. So this is focused on the insects that affect human health or animal health. Uh, there are there are urban entomologists and, and they work on, again, pests that affect human dwellings. So things like spiders and ticks and mites, which not all of those things are insects, but they're all kind of falling under that umbrella of urban entomology. So it's a very broad field that, again, I had no idea that this was even a possibility when I was in high school, let alone for the first few years of my undergraduate degree. So agricultural entomology is the study of insects in agricultural settings. It's also the study of insect interactions with plants because a lot of the insects that we focus on are considered pests. So they're largely herbivores that eat plants and we don't want them to do that because we want yield from those plants. So we're looking at how the plant interacts with those insects and how the insects interact with the plants to try to disrupt those interactions and prevent yield loss. And that leads into pest management strategies, which is a really big part of the research I do, is asking how can we manage these pest populations um, using different approaches like chemical insecticides or biological control or cultural control methods in order to protect yield from these pests. 
So the next few slides that I'm going to show are just going to show some, I think are lovely pictures of, of insects. I'm going to talk a little bit about pests um, and then also predators, pollinators and parasitoids, just to give everyone a bit of an idea of the diversity of insects that we work with as agricultural entomologists. So first up are the pests. And so um, pictured here, I have a red turnip beetle, which is a pest of canola. I have a cabbage seed pod weevil, which uh, is also a pest of canola. I have a, oh, there we go, a pea leaf weevil in the bottom corner. Um, which is a pest of field peas and faba beans. And then in the other bottom corner, there's a very tiny little midge. This is a canola flower midge, which is a relatively new pest that we've just discovered that affects canola. So all of these different insects use plants as their food. And so they can remove yield in different ways. The cabbage seed pod weevil, um, with the picture taken by Shelley Barkley here, it lays its eggs in canola pods and then the larvae eat the canola seeds as the canola seeds are developing. The pea leaf weevil here in the bottom corner, it eats the foliage of the peas as an adult. So this reduces the amount of plant material that can be um, creating nutrients using photosynthesis. So reducing the photosynthetic area of a plant can help reduce the yield that the plant produces. But this insect also lays its eggs onto the soil and then the eggs feed on the root nodules beneath the soil, which also can affect yield. So there's a number of different relationships that plant, that insects can have with their hosts and, and how they feed on the plant can have different impacts on yield loss. It's also important to note that the different ways that insects feed on plants can affect the best way to try to manage those insects. So for the um, cabbage seed pod weevil up here in the corner, for example, in order to control it, we have to prevent the adults from laying eggs because if once the eggs are laid, those eggs are protected inside the pod of the canola plant. So we have to think about those interactions and how insects use their host and what part of the insect life cycle is most damaging in order to try to control that insect in the best way. So those are some of the pests that we deal with on the prairies. The red turnip beetle isn't a really huge pest, but it's a very pretty picture. And so I wanted to give everyone a bit of a diversity. Most of these insects are beetles and beetles are one of the biggest taxonomic groups or categories in the insect, um, in the insect, oh gosh, <laughs> my taxonomy is not great, but beetles are one of the biggest orders of insects. And so a lot of our insect pests on the prairies are beetles, but we also deal with insect pests that are um, flies, like the midge that I've pictured here, as well as grasshoppers, which are odonata. So there's a number of different groups of insects that can be pests, and there's a lot of diversity. So as you can imagine, being an agricultural entomologist can be very interesting and a huge challenge. So the insects that I've got shown on this picture or on this slide are all parasitoids. And so parasitoids lay eggs inside their insect hosts, and then those parasitoid eggs hatch, and the parasitoid larvae feed on the host from usually the inside out and will kill their host before the adult parasitoid emerges. So parasitoids are different from parasites because parasites keep their hosts alive to feed on them for a very long time. So it's almost like a symbiotic relationship whereas the parasitoid always kills its host. And so the parasitoids I've got pictured here, some of them I really don't know what they're parasitoids of, but they're cool pictures. Um, the parasitoid here down in the bottom corner with the picture taken by Mike Lewis, that's a very small parasitoid, only about two millimeters long, that is a parasitoid of a very serious pest of citrus trees. And that's the parasitoid that I worked on when I worked in California. Uh, the big guy with the gray background, that's just a great picture that I took of a parasitoid in my backyard this summer. And it's probably a parasitoid of spiders. So um, spider wasps will inject a spider with venom that paralyzes it, and then they'll carry it back to their nest and then lay their eggs on the, on the spider that's parasitized or the, that's paralyzed. 
So um, if you see really bright metallic blue parasitoids flying around, they're often spider parasitoids, which are very cool because personally I'm arachnophobic. So um, arachnophobic entomologists do exist. And I'll just talk about this other parasitoid here for a minute. So this one that's shown on the uh, right side of my screen with this ovipositor that's really long, this is a parasitoid that attacks insects that are developing inside trees. So they use this big long ovipositor here to drill through the tree bark and into the tree a couple of centimeters and then lay their egg on their host that's inside the tree. So this parasitoid has to search along the tree bark to find where its host is inside the tree and then drill through the wood using this ovipositor in order to lay their eggs. So the ecology and the relationships between parasitoids and pest insects are really interesting and are a completely, can be a completely different or a complete career in itself just to study those interactions. The insects that I've got pictured here are all different predators. So most predators are generalists and they'll eat basically any insect that they come across. Parasitoids on the last slide, a lot of those are very host specific. So there's only a few different insects or insect species that they will lay their eggs into. But predators tend to eat whatever they can find. And so I've got um, pictured here, this is an ambush bug. You'll all often find those in alfalfa plants or in other flowering plants, they blend in very well. They basically wait for their prey to wander by and then they reach out and grab them and eat them. Um, the two pictures, uh, kitty corner to each other, those are both ground beetles. So you'll find these on the ground, they wander around, they eat slugs or eggs and other insects that are smaller than them, basically anything they can find. And although they're not insects, spiders are very important predators in agricultural systems. So this is a wolf spider pictured here. And finally, I think pollinators are something that we give a lot of attention to these days. Uh, there's concern about um, the decline in pollinator populations, but they're very important um, ecologically. And so while my research doesn't really focus on pollinators, I know a number of entomologists who work for Ag Canada who do focus on pollinators and the health of pollinator populations. So I've pictured here um, a standard honeybee, some different butterfly species, and then a native bee in the bottom corner. It's actually on my finger. So I like to let insects land on me and then take pictures of them. And so this little guy, that was that's my finger in, in the picture. Uh, so um, these are important pollinators, but there are others that I don't have shown here. Uh, flies are actually really great pollinators. So they're not very pretty looking, most people don't find flies very interesting. We think that they're very annoying when they get in our houses, but flies are really important pollinators. They can be almost as important as the bees are. So in my research, again, I'm not always very interested in pollinators, but we do work to try to figure out how much or how, how large our pollinator populations are and how we can attract different pollinators into different crops using um, cropping diversity and, and various approaches like that. So I just wanted to end a little bit after talking about the different groups of insects that we work in in agriculture and just talk really quickly about some of the work that we do in my program. And um, as mentioned when I was introduced, a really large part of what we do is monitor pest populations. So we do that using a few different uh, approaches. We can use a sweep net, which is shown in the upper corner here. This is a person out in the field beating the foliage with a net. It collects all the insects inside the net, and then we can dump those out and look at them and count them later on. We also use different types of traps. So the, the trap here at the top, that is a delta pheromone trap. There's a pheromone lure inside it. And that pheromone lure is generally specific to a certain kind of insect pest that we're interested in. So the, the insects are attracted to the pheromone and then they get caught in the trap and we can count them. We also use sticky cards, which are shown here, this big yellow card. 
And so yellow is a color that a lot of insects are attracted to. So it's a trap for a number of different species, basically anything that's attracted to yellow, we can hang them in trees, we can hang them in crops, and then look for the different insects on those traps. It's a very passive way of monitoring. And we also use pitfall traps. And so this is a pitfall trap here in panel B that's buried in the ground. And basically what in this particular case, the pitfall trap is baited with a pheromone lure, so it is supposed to be more attractive to a certain kind of insect than all others. But without a pheromone lure, the pitfall trap works basically the same way. We bury them into the ground right at ground level, and then insects will walk up and fall into the trap. They'll be collected in some antifreeze or um, soapy water, and then they'll drown, and then we can pull them out and we can count them later. So all of these techniques are used to count insects and to estimate insect populations. And this is actually me out in a canola field with my net up in northern Alberta. So I get to travel around a lot for the work that I do, myself and my technicians and my students. And so we, we get to see a lot of Western Canadian landscape. The picture isn't great when it's blown up this much, but I promise that is me out there in the field. And then with those sweep net samples, we can bring them back we look for specific pests in them, but we also can see what the other diversity is in the field. And this is where we get an idea of the different um, parasitoids. So there's a whole row of parasitoids in this picture. We can estimate the number of predators in the fields. We can look at the number of pollinators in the field. And so in a canola field that blooms, a lot of different insects are attracted to those fields and we see a lot of diversity. So that gives us an idea of the health of our ecosystems because the more insects that are there, the better in general, unless they're all pests, which is very rare. So you'll see a lot of things in a sweep net, but only a few of them are probably going to be robbing you of yield. So when we go out and we conduct a survey, say for the cabbage seed pod weevil, we go out to a number of fields across Western Canada where we know that the weevil is present. We take sweep samples in the field and we bring all those back to the lab. We process the samples using these trays like I've shown here. And we count all of the cabbage seed pod weevils, but I also like to count everything else just to know what's going on, up to a limit of course. But we count all those cabbage seed pod weevils we estimate how many we found per sweep at each field, and then we use that information to provide a map. And these maps are shown and shared with growers so that growers know what their approximate risk is for cabbage seed pod weevil damage in their field. And so red is bad. So in this little area here, beside kind of close to Calgary, between Calgary and Lethbridge, there's probably going to be more risk of a cabbage seed pod weevil infestation in your canola field than if you are growing canola up around Edmonton or even around Saskatoon, for example. So we use these maps to, sh to share information with growers and they're made by a huge team of people. So there's people from different provincial governments who go out and collect these samples. Um, myself and, and my students, my technicians, we go out and we collect samples and then process them. Uh, farmers and agronomists help us collect this data. Once we have all the data collected, then my um, computer science technician, David, he creates these maps so that we can show them to everyone who's interested in these populations. So I think what we do is, is quite interesting. There's a lot of different opportunities for research in the field of entomology. There's a lot of different things to do within the field of agricultural entomology that I had no idea even existed until I was in university. Uh, so I hope that maybe some of you are inspired to, to look into entomology as a career. Insects are pretty cool. Um, but yeah, so this is what we do. And so I just wanna say thank you for your attention today. And I hope that if you have questions, my contact information is here and I'm always very happy to take, to answer questions by email as well as, as in person. So thank you. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Van Kuski. And we do have a question for you from Danielle in Vibank. And she's asking what your favorite type of, what is your favorite type of bug that you've worked on? So my absolute favorite type of insects that I've worked on are weevils. Uh, so a lot of the pictures that I showed there with the, the um, pests are different weevil species. There's broad nose weevils, which have flat noses, but then there's also the long nose weevils, which have those longer noses. 
Um, I think weevils are pretty cute, um, even though they can be really important pests in our ecosystems. They're also one of the more diverse groups of the beetles. So there's, there's a lot of weevils out there that uh, affect different plants, but uh, most of them aren't pests, but they can be very, very beautiful. Parasitoids are probably the second on that list. They're very neat as well. Thank you. Okay, awesome. And then I have a follow-up question about the parasitoids. Is there ever a case where they can be beneficial, where you would want them to happen, occur? Absolutely. So parasitoids and predators and pollinators are all what we call beneficial insects, and they're natural enemies of a lot of the pests. So in a biological control program to manage a pest, we're often introducing parasitoids to attack the, the pest species. So parasitoids are awesome. You definitely, if you see them, they're great. Leave them alone, let them do their thing. A lot of them are referred to as wasps because they are taxonomically very closely related to the, the yellow jackets that we see, um, but they will, they have no effect on people. So, and a lot of them are very small. So you'll probably never know that they're there, but parasitoids are one of the number one good insects in our fields. Okay. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Vankowski. And thank you to everybody for attending. We did go a few minutes over, but I really appreciate everybody's patience and all of this. Um, I do see that um, Timon had a question for Dr. Smith. And Dr. Smith, thank you so much for answering. Um, if you want to have a, a, maybe a couple, uh, a minute long uh, answer to that, go for it. Um, otherwise, I think we better wrap up fairly quickly. That's half the minute gone trying to work the, work no, the microphone. <laughs> Just a question about mutations. I mean, they can happen in many different ways. One of the main ones is when cells divide in an organism, they copy their own DNA and they're not perfect. They're copying like billions of base pairs. They make mistakes every so often. But also when a plant or a cell gets DNA damage, say from UV light or something like that, they're very good at repairing themselves. But again, they can make mistakes and that's how you get kind of natural mutations. And if they're useful, they can be propagated. If they're bad, they probably just end up disappearing. Okay, fantastic. Well, thank you so much to all our presenters. Um, one thing that I actually will mention is that um, with Regina District Industry Education Council, they do have a survey um, so teachers, if you can please have your students fill that out. And I think that uh, Renette will send that to you. Um, other than that, we just want to say a big thank you to our presenters, to our participants. Thank you so very much. Um, teachers and students, you guys are welcome to log off. And uh, any presenters um, that want to stay on, you're welcome to stay on just for a quick follow up. But I think that's all that I had for the most part.